Ingersoll. I am super excited to have you on our, our mastermind call tonight. Uh, we have some very special guests, and uh, I see a whole bunch of you guys have been signing in. We had a big, big amount of registrations. Um, those of you guys that signed in early tonight, thank you very much. We always appreciate that very much. Um, so let's see who's uh, who's on here. We got uh, Andrew and Barb. How are you? Bob Spurgeon, you are the man. Thank you. Um, Bob uh, Withers and Cedric and Chaz. Connor Steinbrook, what kind of deals are you cooking up this week, Connor? You've, you've quickly been making money in this group, which is good to see. Corey, it's nice to see you tonight. Also nice to connect with you in LinkedIn this week. Uh, David Phelps, my good buddy. Um, look forward to connecting with you on the cruise uh, in about 30 days. Dennis Elliott, our South Carolina guy. Doug Lukey in Dallas, Ed Grove, Franz, Gregory, Hugh, Ian, Claridge, James Peters, Jeffrey Love. I'm going to skip some here because there's so many people coming in. Um, Joe McGuire. Lisa Masterson said aloha. Lisa, aloha to you as well. Can you guys all hear me okay? Um, Gupreet, it's nice to uh, to see you tuning in um, from San Diego, same place our guests are from tonight. Maria and Mark and Mary and Nick Sirocco. Nick, we were talking about you before the call started because uh, one of our guests has been in Long Island the last few days over in Shirley, and he's headed to he's in Cleveland now, and then headed up towards uh, New York, um, looking at houses. Uh, Renee and Ricardo and Ron and Ronnie, Rudy and uh, Wilbert. Man, there's a lot of guys on tonight, which I love. It is so good to see everybody. Um, tonight, uh, usually at the beginning, we have a quick check-in where I where I ask you guys what you've been up to. You tell me what kind of deals you're working on, what kind of money meetings you're having, what kind of deals you're finding. Um, but tonight, we're going to uh, switch it around. Just a little bit. So really quickly, like in, in about three minutes from now, we're going to start digging right into seller finance content with our guests. And then at the end, we're going to open up and, and talk to all of you guys. Great. Lisa, thank you. And uh, Bob, it's good for your, good to see your comments. Randy, it's nice to see you. Peter, did you get sound, Peter? You're the only one who said you had a little bit of issue with sound. So hopefully you got that fixed up. Jeffrey Love, it is good to see you coming in from... Florida, if I remember right. And uh, okay, just uh, to refresh everybody's uh, memory here, this is our mastermind call, but I want to um, show you something else here real quick. Um, if I can find it beneath all these PowerPoints and stuff. There we go. There's our site. There's a lot of activity on here the last few days. Jared uh, caught, I don't think Jared's on, but he had some pipes burst in uh, Chicago. Um, so if you guys have experience uh, with that, give him some help. Um, it's hard to believe for all of you guys on the West Coast or in Florida or down south that you could have pipes freezing and bursting already, but it happens. Nick Sirocco, you have generated some really incredible uh, discussions. David Phelps, thank you very much for helping light bulbs go off today and John, with John Groom as well. This is a really good thread on taxes and, and um, being a real estate professional and being careful with that designation and some other ways of doing it using financial friends and creating those passive losses. And uh, David, the way, the way that you articulated it, I know that Nick nailed it when he, when he wrote what he did. So thank you. Here's some more houses that, that uh, Jared's been working on, which I always love seeing your pictures, guys. If you have pictures, that's great. Um, it's more people in San Diego. Here's a loan broker in San Diego who's working on a deal in New York City. Looks like a pretty good deal. Um, so there is a lot of stuff going on in here right now. Um, and if you guys are coming on the IRA cruise with myself and David Phelps and some of the others, make sure you let us know. Rich Lennon and Barb Thomas are coming um, because we're going to do some um, private time on that as well. Some private face-to-face -face time where we can do some uh, masterminds. So Lisa said right off the bat, I've closed on seven homes with owner financing, three more in a few weeks. Lisa, you are a seller financing machine. Seven houses, that's awesome. And three more, that'll give you 10. That is freaking rolling. Way to go. 
All right, we're going to come back to all of your questions in just a couple of minutes. Let me uh, kind of kick this off a little bit here with a quick PowerPoint for you guys. Let me get the right one up here. There we go. All right, this is our Bank Illumination Blueprint Mastermind. We do these the first and the third Wednesday of every month. And tonight we have a really cool um, strategy for you. It's an alternate exit strategy to being a landlord. And this works in all markets across the United States. It's a lot more passive idea than being a landlord. Um, but there's some pros and cons associated with it. Uh, but particularly if you're in a higher end market, this is a great strategy for you and you're going to really enjoy it. You know, it was Napoleon Hill in his book, Think and Grow Rich, that gave us the original purpose back in the 1930s about building a mastermind. And uh, that's why there's so many of us every two weeks of our lives that get to hang out online and do this kind of in a virtual setting. But he said that it's the coordination of knowledge and effort and the spirit of harmony between two or more people for the attainment of a definite purpose. So what is our definite purpose tonight? It's always investing in, in uh, assets, of course, and creating cash flow and equity without banks, watching your risk and maximizing your returns. And tonight, the good news is we're going to give you an alternate idea um, on how to do it on the exit. Now, we've talked a lot in the past about how to do it on the acquisition side. People like Lisa Masterson are buying 10 houses uh, in a month with seller financing. And uh, that's a cool way to do it. You can get packages and do all kinds of great things on the acquisition side. But once in a while, it makes great sense to also do it on the exit side. But what's everybody's concern with doing it on the exit? What's everyone been talking about for the last 12 months? A lot of people are concerned with this thing called the Dodd-Frank, right? The DF, the Dodd-Frank. And we're going to get into that tonight as well. Uh, because we have some really extraordinary guests who are going to help us out. We got Mark Stein and Terry Lewis on the on the line with us here, um, on the webcast with us. Um, they're investors in San Diego, but really, I I've really got to know these guys, and they're really seller financing specialists, and especially in the Dodd Frank compliance area. But they love the note business, uh, creating notes, brokering notes, buying and selling property and notes all in the area of seller financing. Um, so uh, with that being said, I want to go ahead and switch this slide over to uh, you, Mark. And uh, you can take us away here. Did you get the prompt? I did. Thanks, Jim. Okay. How are you on sound? I can hear you. Can everybody hear Mark Stein okay? And can everybody see his slides okay? I uh, don't think your slides are up. There they are. Okay, great. And I think we lost sound, Mark. I cannot hear you now. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. You sound good. Okay. Bob Perfect. Spurgeon and other people said they can hear you, so I think we're good to go. Fantastic. All right, well. Welcome, guys. Uh, good to good to be with you, Jim. We're uh, always excited to talk about one of our favorite topics: seller financing, real estate notes, and then not as exciting, but definitely uh, definitely our, our hands are tied. So Terry and I say, why not accept it, Dodd Frank? So we're going to talk about those three topics tonight, and in the next hour, I'm going to go through these slides, and then I'm actually in Los Angeles waiting to speak at the Creative Real Estate Association, Investors Association at the top of the hour. And at that point, Terry is going to take over. And he's actually on the opposite coast, on the East Coast. So uh, with that being said, let's, uh, let's get started. So really what we're going to talk about tonight is real estate notes, how to create them, how to buy them, how to broker them. And really, uh, as someone who, who we are involved with in California, Don uh, Rickenbaugh talks about this, this interplay and interface between the paper and the property. So this is us. We uh, we are real estate brokers and mortgage loan originators and also investors. Uh, this next wave we figure and we've been looking at ever since Dodd-Frank came out and was passed over four years ago, we think seller financing is coming back kind of like in the 80s where it was one out of three transactions. So we'll certainly talk about that and get into it. And really, we want you to 
think of a few th a few themes, and really we talk about this new shift. And as we go through these slides and as these ahas get turned on in your head, you'll probably see a few of the slides uh, because we're, we've definitely been around. And by and large, this is a brand new presentation. I actually haven't even scripted it, and that's kind of how we like to do things. But <laughs> Basically, uh, you know, if, if you're on Daniel's uh, list, he, he talked about the fact that real estate investing has become this circus where all the clowns are crowding into the same car. And, and really, it's, uh, you know, getting away from this me too. And, and creative is good. Creative is coming back and creative is where, it, where it's at. And realistically, Terry and my background is, is that of real estate brokering and, you know, that and mortgage loans, people don't need you. They don't need you to quote a rate or put your property on the MLS. And, and Jim, I'm sure you guys have agents on your, your subscriber list like we do, right? Yeah, we sure do. We have plenty. Yeah, we do. We have, uh, we have, mortgage, yeah, we have mortgage folks and we have uh, plenty of realtors and brokers as okay. well. Yeah, there we have a good mix. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, so I mean, this is the trend that we're going through. Is is you know we have this commoditization of the real estate industry, and and basically, if if you're an investor and you're out there just you know, well, I can buy your house for cash. So what? A anyone can do that, and and I you know I can buy your house at a massive discount. So what? So really, what we want to turn you on to is getting and separating yourself from the crowd, and. Really, the two themes for us, and and again, you know, if you're successful being a landlord, great. Uh, we're not here to bag on that, and we're not here to tear that apart. If if you've been successful with that, and and you, you enjoy it, and you feel feel comfortable with it, great. Keep doing it. Maybe this is just another idea and another tool to put in your tool belt. But by and large, we kind of feel that you know wholesaling and landlording is you know, really under attack, it, almost like uh, real estate brokering is where you're seeing buyers go and buy without an agent and you're seeing people go and get their loans done online. So really getting out of this commoditization of the real estate industry is, is really where uh, seller financing and, and notes is all about because it's all about providing solutions. And let's face it, the, the deals are, are definitely getting skinny. You know, there's fewer and fewer wholesale deals out there. The margins are paper thin. You have a ton more competition. Uh, you have the banks on, you know, on your your distressed inventory that that are are not discounting or accepting discounts anymore. And you know, you're limited in terms of what you can do if if all you you know you're basically a one trick pony. So, um, I'm getting a a thing on my audio. Am I good? It was spotty earlier, but it's getting better. Weird. Yep. So keep on moving. I think you're okay. Okay. So a couple, couple different themes here is, is stop being a landlord. If you don't like it and if it's sucking for you, you know, look at doing something else because property management can suck. You have taxes, tenants, toilets. Uh, toilets, termites, you have a low rate of return and you have lower cash flow as opposed to other more creative, better, safer, smarter options with respect to ex exit strategies. And realistically, this is kind of what, you know, we, I'm sure some of you have seen this slide before and, and this is kind of what people are nervous about. And, you know, realistically, if you're providing solutions, it doesn't really necessarily matter where we are at because you can do it while eliminating and re drastically reducing your risk. So realistically, when we look at this, it's important to understand and it's important to understand with respect to what is the global context of the industry that we're involved in. At the same time, what is our underlying strategy? Are we out there providing solutions for people? And this is kind of our perspective for this next year. We, we think it's a perfect storm for seller financing. Um, and really what we operate by is this idea of the bank of you. It's about control. You don't need to buy a property. You don't need to throw a bunch of money into a property. You don't necessarily even need to get a private money lender. Although you guys and uh, Daniel's not on the call, but you and you, Jim and Daniel, you guys, you know, have a great program to show people how to uh, get money from their folks. And certainly that's a great orientation. Um, but sometimes you don't even need that. 
So what is the history with respect to seller financing? Just like we talked about in the 80s, we saw the market absolutely erupt and we saw pretty much one out of three transactions were done in the form of seller financing. Um, obviously when the subprime market came back, there was no need for seller financing unless of course you were, you know, like a father son kind of deal and you wanted to document your, your transaction. But realistically we're going back and, and we've actually written articles called back to the future because we think we are absolutely completely entirely going back there. And a lot of the underlying data that we've been seeing coming out, even over the last four years, it continues to show this overall strategy on the rise. Uh, and, and of course today you have so many buyers that do not simply do not qualify. You have, uh, you know, capital gains now as high as 47%. So people are afraid of this. And of course, a regulatory environment that will probably in our lifetimes never allow the sheer number and the sheer percentage of buyers to actually become qualified legitimately for a regular loan. So of course, interest rates on the rise and we can keep going over and over, but what it goes back to is this idea of the, the perfect storm for seller financing, all the environmental macroeconomic factors and we're certainly not here to talk about numbers but we could and, and if we did they would certainly support this concept that seller financing is back and the future obviously when we think about uh, where we're at today and where we're going in the future it and the sheer number of retirees and that moves us into the next slide um, you know, these are people that are now beginning turned on to this idea. Well, what are you going to do with your money? You can't put it in the stock market. You can't get, you know, a quarter of a percent return from the banks. Realistically, people need to eat. People need to survive. So the benefits obviously are, are massive. The benefits are, are definitely there. The bef benefits are, um, you know, with respect to the seller and really with you guys as the investor or the agent or even the loan officer, depending on what hat you wear, you can do skinny deals and you can baffle the competition. And really that's what it's all about is becoming more innovative, becoming more creative with respect to the way that you do do business. And to the degree that you can provide solutions and separate yourself from all the other clouds jumping into the same car is to the degree of how many more deals you're going to be doing the the lady Jim I can't remember that you mentioned who who's working on her tenth deal I, I would have to su suspect that's that's her thinking cap right yeah Lisa is is making a lot of deals absolutely right and you know I really like the way that you you show what's yeah. in it in it for the seller here um, because when you're making acquisitions with seller financing you can make them a win win. Um, transaction. The seller does get a lot of stuff. Even, you know, some of the things not on their list would be like selling it as is, maybe selling it for a little higher price for a, a little lower interest, um, not having to do open houses, not having to list, not having to pay commission. I mean, there's a lot of benefits to a seller. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the list goes on and on and you don't have to be, you know, you don't have to have your, your pipes broken either, in, you know, landlording. And, you know, I know that's one of your strategies for deal sourcing is burnt out landlords. And I, yeah. I think we're seeing a lot of those people in retirement now. So these are the different strategies and, and don't, don't get too wrapped up in this. They're just different ways to do a deal, different, different bows you can tie on a package. But it's good to know and it's good to, to look at. And, you know, certainly with respect to you guys who are agents out there, we're starting to see uh, loan assumptions coming back. Not a lot, but a little bit. And certainly, you know, because we track everything in San Diego County, which is where we're and eventually we'll be doing it, you know, tracking all properties in, in Southern California that uh, fall under potential uh, seller make care. But we're seeing loan assumptions come back, which have been gone for so, so long. And realistically, this is definitely uh, continues to be an emerging strategy, whether you're in California, Texas, or Virginia. So where are our sellers? And that was something that Jim, you asked us specifically to talk about is, you know, wh where are we targeting sellers? Where are we targeting buyers? Let's let's look at this, and just because you know we put this together on, on the fly, uh, I don't have the source, but these numbers are, are pretty consistent. If we look at this demographic of 76 million baby boomers, now just stop 
and for a moment think about that sheer demographic and that number and, and how much th this is a major, major, major trend. You know, we've never had a population like this. What's even more, and we talk about this perfect storm, 90%, and this was a, I can't remember if it was in the Wall Street Journal or, you know, I can't remember where it was reported and if I had more time to put this together, I, I certainly would, would quote it and source it, but 90% of the wealth of this population, this 76 million baby boomers going into retirement right now at a time where healthcare is spiraling out of cost, uh, out of out of control at way higher costs and certainly, uh, you know, when we think about people living longer and longevity issues, 90% of the wealth of these people, these baby boomers, is wrapped up in home equity. So unless they know something that we don't know, you can't when you need to eat, you can't go out and peel off the shingles off your roof and cook them up for dinner. We, we know, you know, we, we know that you still have to, you still have expenses. Death is not a retirement plan. So this is a huge population, and right now at the same time, we're starting to see properties that aren't selling. So you know, if you look in your MLS, you could literally go shopping with these strategies, which is really cool. And and I was here, Daniel, talking about the good old days when he used to. You know, log on to the MLS and go shopping, and um, I'm sure I'm sure Jim, you you did your fair share. Yeah, of that it was as like well. it was like going out to eat. You just look <laughs> at the menu and choose which house you want. And what <laughs> happened is it for, it allowed investors to get a little bit lazy on deal sourcing because it was yeah. so easy and so juicy so fast. Yeah, so that's what we're going to talk about here is is how to do these skinny deals and and how to even though it's skinny. How to how to still work, you know, work your deals. So we have baby boomers that that need to live, and and they're retiring, and as we speak, we also have low equity homeowners. These are people we'll call them, you know, 10% equity, where you know they can't do a traditional real estate transaction. These are a lot of your for sale by owners. Again, you can go shopping with these people. We'll give you what to you know tell them and and how to you know how to get yourself in front of them but realistically when we talk about and think about these low equity people we can actually increase that number probably double it when we think of people that are maybe 10% upside down and certainly in your guys' market where you know you have a lower price point home you know 10% uh, not that big a deal if you're providing a solution for the buyer and seller as a matchmaker so become a provider of two solutions to the sellers. If we can give a seller, let's say, a 7% interest rate, which is a fair shake, that's about 35 times what the banks would pay them on their equity. And if you really think about it, a retiree doesn't need all their money. They certainly don't need all their money to throw it in a bank. And if they do throw it in a bank, how are they going to live off of a quarter of a point, half a point, whatever? It's just, you know, there's just not enough consideration, not a big enough bank account to spin off enough month income for them to survive. And then, of course, the other population is this alternative to a short sale or an alternative, I should even say, to a for sale by owner or an alternative to, you know, no profit being made. And we'll show you how you can do these deals where, you know, you have someone that's at 90 to 110 percent equity. You know, if they're at 120%, there becomes a point where you just simply can't do it. But why is this, and what we're going to talk about, why is this better than wholesaling? And again, if wholesaling is working for you, great. Keep doing it. Maybe this is just an alternative. We're not here to, to bag on a way you've been doing and making a living. However, when you go to a seller, and as Jim said earlier, you, you say, you know, we can give you a higher price. In, in our case, uh, we have a strategy where we come. We'll give we can give you full price, and you know, I I have to guess that if you take ten sellers and you pitch them on full price versus sixty five percent, I I think you're gonna have more sellers that are gonna listen to you, and more sellers that are gonna allow you to sit down in their home. And when we think and talk about this trend of them getting away from real estate agents, you can come in there as just like you would as a wholesale deal, and assign a short sale contract and we're going to talk about that very shortly. Um, you, you become a solution provider to the homeowner, in the seller in terms of giving them income that they desperately need. This is more profitable and it's a win-win for you and the seller and of course the buyer because let's face it, if you are flipping one of these deals or assigning one of these deals to a buyer who cannot qualify for credit, 
We're going to talk about this in just a second. That's the greatest upgrade. You you cannot upgrade a house in, in this climate that we're in in the U.S. You cannot upgrade a house as much as you could if you were to provide financing. And financing now has become the most valuable, the scarcest, the highest and best upgrade that you can put in a home. And you're putting it in simply by using your brains. And the fact that you're on this call means that you're interested in doing that. Just as fast as wholesaling. So the pitch is the same to the wholesaler in terms of speed. And of course you have a large and willing buyer pool. So who are our buyers? We have foreigners, you know, the foreign national programs. I don't know how familiar you are with. No, the, go, ahead, you know, go ahead and explain that a little bit. And this is an area I wanted to focus on for the exit strategy. Because if you, sure. it's very easy to rent a house, but it yeah. takes a little bit different marketing to find a buyer who doesn't quite qualify for traditional financing, but does have a nice down payment. So yeah. going through who those people are and how you, how you connect to them through marketing is important. Yeah, I'm going to give you I'm, – I'm guessing you guys, are, since you're in Virginia, you have a lot of military yep. people in military areas. So I'm, I'm going to give you a couple of good strategies with, with respect to that that are very cool. uh, geographic specific. We're in San Diego, so of course uh, oh, we yeah. know a little bit about Coronado. the military. <laughs> so uh, buyers, foreigners. There's four national programs where a foreigner has to come in and put like a 50% down payment and realistically um, – you know, it's it's just it's not very doable. But what if you could tell a foreigner, you know, 20% down? You could massively increase this pool. And, and, and let's let's be very clear. There's million. I don't know the numbers. And again, I, this is a new presentation. I haven't even looked at it. I'm just kind of doing it on off my hip. Uh, but realistically, if you look at foreigners and think of foreigners, there are millions that would like to buy here that simply cannot get credit. Those foreign national programs, and I'm sure you guys have some lenders that are on this call that you know that have their foreign national programs. You know, typically they have to put at least 50% down. Well, in terms of providing solutions of providing credit for people, you can have them put a 20% down payment. So you can really uh, baffle the competition with respect to opening up channels to bring in and provide credit for for national uh, buyers. Let's talk about renters. Uh, recently we've discovered that as much as 6 million people want to buy in this country but simply cannot. Uh, at the same time, when we think of renters, and I'm, I'm going to ask you a hypothetical uh, question, mm -hmm. but uh, how many people do you think out there would like to buy if they could buy? And this is a great strategy in, in markets like yours. How many you know people in the military would like to buy if they could buy and their payment would remain the same? Right. Absolutely. And then so you got foreigners, you got renters, then you know, and then you could expand that circle a little and say people that maybe that that a bank gave a bad mortgage to. And yep, uh, yep, they had yep. a foreclosure. Exactly. Maybe they did a short sale. And they don't want to wait three years, right? When yeah, you start it's an thinking bigger, about it, it's an even bigger population when you mm -hmm. when you bring in that. But these are these are the main ones, and you know, realistically, you can go in there on a pro. And, and again, I'm not talking about a listing where someone listed it yesterday, and you're going to go in there and try to be fancy. This is not right for every seller. And not at every seller is going to be open to it. But if you have properties that have been sitting on the market, they need to sell or they can't sell, they, they've expired, they have for sale by owners, if you can go in there and offer them their price, then you know with your left hand and your right hand, you can offer a buyer who can't buy with you know get credit qualified. You can offer them to buy a home uh, for this for this you know basically with the same payment as their rent. It becomes very attractive to both sides. And again, you're in the middle. It's a mass matchmaker. So, you know, a lot of people talk, you know, they get intimidated because, you know, we, we work in an industry where people say, you know, people always say, well, it doesn't work that. And you hear this in the new business even more than the real estate business. And, and these guys that think there's, there's some protocol for how you do things and, you know, they always want to tell people you shouldn't do that or that's not how it works or, you know, that's not how it happens, blah, 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 blah. But the reality of it is, is there's really no rules with your purchase contract. It, it's a blank piece of paper. You know, there's certain disclosures. Let, let's be clear. You know, Terry and I are both real estate brokers. There's certain disclosures that have to be made in accordance with your state law and obviously now with federal law. But realistically, it's a blank piece of paper. So, the terms are as creative as you want to make them. 
when we present it to the seller, of course, we want to put together a amortization schedule so that it makes and looks more makes your offer look that much more attractive to your uh, to your seller, and they can see, holy cow! Uh, not only am I getting more than I get, you know, selling it traditionally through an agent and throwing on MLS and all that, and fixing it up, and of course, paying closing costs for the buyer and repair credits and et cetera, et cetera. But not only am I getting, I, I'm, you know, maybe I'm getting up to 150% more than what I otherwise would have gotten when I, when I encapsulate how much of cash flow and how much income I'd be getting. So with your real estate contract, you always want to put together an amortization schedule because it makes your purchase contract look that much more attractive. And, you know, again, think creative. So notes. Creative ways to buy and hold, and I think this works really good with the, the whole bank elimination uh, concept and the whole bank elimination uh, blueprint is really one of the, the, the great things that you should be thinking is how do I get private investor money to go in and, and buy a deal uh, where, you know, and I know you guys talk about joint venture, and, and that's great. Uh, another tool in your tool belt is something that we talk about is you set up an 80, you know, you set up two notes, a first and a second, and you buy the property using someone else's money, and you use that essentially to sell them the paper. So you, you're originating creating the paper, you're selling it off to the investor, and then you're holding on to the second. The second mortgage is all cash flow, what we call, uh, you know, the tail. So, uh, so and then that that is if if there's probably folks on the call that have never heard that strategy before. Yeah. But think about it a little bit because it is a dynamite strategy that will will really skyrocket what you're trying to do. Oh yeah. It, I mean, you throw us in your 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 self-directed IRA. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's 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 income. You know, you do one wholesale deal, you're you're paid and done. You know, you're never going to get paid again. You know, one of the cool things we'll, we'll talk about shortly is brokering notes. You know, you, you can, you know, you can create one of these notes for your sellers that, that you did the deal and made the financial gain from, and then you can go back and broker the note with them and, and make another flat fee or, you know, two to three percent, maybe more if you get, you know, if you pick up the buyer. So um, when we talk about keep the tail, that means the second mortgage. It's just a, a creative way to go buy a property. You never want to go in there and talk to your seller and say, "Here's what we do," you know, and and, and give them one solution because if they don't like your solution, uh, you're done. If you offer them multiple solutions and find out what they want, you know, well, I want maximum property for my house, value for my house. Great, we have a solution for that. Yeah, um, you know, Mark. If, the, what I like to do is I like to sometimes I'll give them more than one solution, more than one offer with seller financing, yeah. and I'll yeah, say, "Which yeah. of these works best for you?" 100%. And that, and that, that just creates that that kind of takes the obstacle of saying no out of it and it opens yeah. up a conversation to what their needs are and any of them are good with me yeah i mean it's it's like heads i win tails i win now, you're you're basically you know the mortgage coach from you know 10 years ago 15 years ago they came up with this concept uh you know and it's it's really the concept of comparison so you know if you can get them to compare your three offers against your three offers rather than your offer against three other investors offers you win you know what do you care you know head head that win tails I win and that's the way you really want to think about is is I'm here to provide a, a solution and you know it's uh, kind of like Terry and I we, yeah we have a real estate license we have an investor cap we've got a mortgage loan origination originators tool belt and if you come in there with solutions you're gonna really come away uh, with a, a way higher closing ratio, and again, you know, uh, one of our friends he always talks about being a one, don't be a one-trick pony. If you go in there and say, you know, here, here's what I'm going to offer you on the price, and they say no, you're done. You know, so so don't be that guy that that offers, you know, comes in with a price of, well, I have to buy it for 65%. You're you're not going to get that many deals, and your closing ratio is going to be that much lower. So when we talk about uh, assigning the contract, and, and this is a really cool strategy in, in your higher price points. You know, we're in San Diego. Our average uh, median home now is, has gone over 450000 
So you got to buy a seller that you know needs full price. Uh, one, a really cool thing you can do, and again, when we talked about this earlier about uh, the providing financing and providing credit, and to the degree that you're providing credit and financing for someone, you are offering the greatest upgrade you can possibly offer. I don't know how it is in your market. I can just say with respect to our market and anything that you know has has approached uh, you know higher levels of unaffordability, the higher a level of unaffordability, the greater you providing the credit is going to be towards the uh, towards the buyer. So a very simple strategy: you got a four hundred thousand dollar home. Seller says, "I need full full price." Great, we can give you full price. You write it up at, on one of the eight different strategies that you know we had mentioned earlier, and you essentially assign the contract to uh, to a buyer. And the buyer pays you, your, you know, three percent. You made twelve thousand dollars, Jim. I, I don't know what an average wholesale deal out there pays. What, what about, you know, just throw, throw say five k. Okay, well, perfect. So, you know, it, you know, you, you let's say you have a hundred thousand dollar home out there. Again, if you don't want to do three percent, you could have the, you know, you could have your buyer pay you five thousand dollars. So or, you go in or there. Twenty. <laughs> Sure, I mean, but sure. if you have a a really great deal with with low interest, I mean, yeah, you probably won't want to assign it either. Yeah, yeah there's I mean, more ways you can make a lot a lot of money for a long time. Yeah, I, I'm I'm what I'm talking about is an alternative to wholesaling. Yep. You know, you you know, in a in an assignment, just like you're assigning a wholesale all cash deal, you can assign a a, a seller finance deal. And you know you can make five thousand, twenty thousand, you know whatever. Certainly you can make it as much as you would make on a wholesale deal. That that's really my point here. Mm -hmm. And you can you know and, and if someone tells you they need full price, think of it like a wholesale only a wholesale at you know think of it at a wholesale at retail value. And you know you're going to have some takers. And I I have to think on average you're going to be looking at more than you'd be making on a wholesale deal anyways. Mm -hmm. And you know, let your you know let your cash buyer investor get the next one. So when we talk about notes, there's three types of notes: performing, non-performing, and created notes. So when we talk about creative financing, they really reside within the realm of non-performing and, and created notes. On a performing note, you're looking on a perfect note, you could buy it at 95 percent. What we call scratch and dent loans, looking at about an eight percent discount. So, you know, Terry and I brokered a bunch at the beginning of the year. I think we got ninety-two percent for them, and um, you know, those are you know basically perfect loans that are not quite at the institutional level. Um, once you start looking at you know performing notes, um, where you know they have some seasoning, at, you know, typically nine months is industry standard. You're looking at uh, you know, you're looking at about 15% discount. Uh, Non-performing notes, of course, you can get at big discounts, and there's people. We'll talk about that shortly. And it's a great way to take over a property with respect to, uh, you know, with respect to coming in and get grabbing the note at such a low a price point. So the same thing applies in terms of valuing the note is credit collateral capacity. So the value of the note is always established when the note is created. And this is something that we we talk about, and this is something that that we really harp on is, you know, don't step over dollars to pick up pennies. So many people are so concerned about, well, Dodd Frank, how do I get around it? And well, I don't want to pay a mortgage loan originator fee. Uh, you know, we'll talk about that br briefly in a little bit. You can bury the 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 price of it. You can you can pass it you can pass it along to the buyer who by the way would be paying a fee anyway regardless and typically more than a seller financed mortgage loan origination fee but realistically you want to look at it of this is your investment so if you're if you're writing a crummy note you know if you're writing crappy paper it's toilet paper and you're going to be subject to very steep discounts as I just outlined you know a perfect note a perfect note that's that that's not have any errors in it. And has the credit collateral and capacity. You're looking at a five percent discount right off the bat. So discounted note investing. You can buy a note, and Terry's actually looking at some for us right now back east. Uh, you can buy notes at uh, big discounts, foreclose on the property. 
you know, there, there, there's, again, there's, and I, I have another list of eight different exit <laughs> strategies with respect to buying the note. Yep. But, um, you know, one thing that people are very comfortable with because it makes sense and it's easy to understand is you can just foreclose on the property. So, you know, I mean, we're talking about massive in terms of how deeply you can get a discounted note. Uh, and in terms of the discounts that we're, we work with, it, you know, you can, you can do really well with discounted notes. Brokering notes, another way to make income and another way to make profits on, on notes. Um, you, you know, you'll see people advertise these in Craigslist. Um, you know, you, you'll see when you guys create a note, you can keep the person in your database and go back to the seller and broker their note. Same thing, just like uh, any other fee. You can build it in, you can build uh, your fee into the sale or you can take a you can take a flat fee, which again can also be built in as well. There's 23 different ways that we know of uh, how to sell a note. Obviously, we don't have time for that, but what, what would you? Uh, we have uh, some folks in our community right now that have a note that they would like to sell. So, you know, knowing those 20 methods, um, which ways do you like the best? Do you just partner with a note broker? Do you try to sell it yourself? We, I mean, we typically would sell, you know, it, it all depends. Uh, there's institutional money out there. Well, we should call it quasi-institutional money where you can get a higher yield on it. Um, you know, it, it just depends on who the seller is, what they want. Um, you know, there, there's, a lot of them are familiar with the discount and they're very leery of the discount. So if you don't have that great of a note, there's a way to build the discount in creatively with how you package it and how you sell it. Um, one of the one of the ways that, that you know that, that we're familiar with and comfortable with is uh, using the time value of money to bury and hide the discount. And the seller thinks they're getting full price. They're not because we know inflation is always at work. But in their mind, they think it is. Uh, we disclose it, and um, you know everyone's happy. Again, it's all about creating that win-win. How do you? That's how really. Do you, if you had to find a a note buyer. On your own, and you've never done it before. How would you find the buyer? See, that's, uh, okay, I can, so I can answer that, Mark. Go ahead, Terry. Hi, guys. This is Terry. Um, uh, great, great uh, conversation, Mark. Um, there's, there's a lot of ways um, to find a note buyer. Um, usually, I would say um, your personal relationships with people that have IRAs mm -hmm. are probably your, your best way to um, to your, sell a note. Your financial friend network, we call it. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I would say personal contacts. This is a personal business. Mm -hmm. um, your personal contacts and relationships are your best return, um, and that's why everybody's on this call, um, is to establish relationships. And um, what, I've, what I've noticed from this industry, from the people that I've been involved with in the last few years, is... <clears throat> um, you really, you know, there's a lot of good people in it, and um, and then, you know, if there's some people that aren't good, they don't last very long in the group. So, yeah. Um, yeah. so it's it's really that that would be my number one source, and then um, the second would be people like like us or you, Jim, um, that that are kind of um, doing this as to make a living. And you know we know people, and then you go into the LinkedIn's, um, some institutional people like Mark said, and um, and and it's all about relationships. I would have to say that that's that's my my best answer. Okay. One one thing I'll add because we need to keep moving moving us along. I, I I got 15 minutes now. I know. You gotta uh, roll. One of the things I want to add, and this is really critical that you guys can, you know, if, if you don't have a whole lot of exposure to the note industry, and, and pretty much everyone learns it the hard way. Uh, you're talking to two people that are probably no different than anyone else in the note industry that, that definitely learned it the hard way. One of the big things is, is there's this uh, kind of like, uh, you know, there's there's this game that of, uh, you know, they call it um, – uh, you know, they, they call it a daisy chain, and that's kind of the industry jargon for, uh, you know, when someone says they have a note and all these brokers try to, you know, everyone's trying to get a piece of it, and you can never really talk and get to the seller. And that's one of the problems with a lot of the institutional notes um, where they're being sold off as 
uh, you know, either discounted notes or even performing notes is, is you can't ever get to the seller. Well, with seller finance notes, we know who the seller is, right? And one of, that's one of the great things about dealing in the seller finance space is you never have to worry about who the seller is. And, it, and when you bring a buyer to the table, and you can certainly bring a buyer to the table, uh, you know, if, if you have a deal, uh, if it's a seller finance note, you know this. You you're talking to the seller. You know who the seller is. We know where it came from, and and that's one of the really cool things that the industry is starting to again, like it was in the '80s, get turned on to is the fact that we don't have to play this uh, dance in this game of brain damage of, of you know who's the seller, and you know it's it just it's great in that sense. So the last one before we 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 got a few Dodd slide uh, Dodd. Frank slides, uh, you know, because it, it is relevant. And next year will be the year where they begin enforcing it, and the legions of, of Dodd Frank attorneys are going to start coming after people. Oh, who are out I of think compliance. you're right. And this kind of fit really kind of merges what we do with what you do. And I mentioned this earlier: is think of yourself like a matchmaker, you know, as as a high end matchmaker who is providing solutions. Buyers who can't buy, sellers who can't sell, and investors who need to live. And when we think about that third demographic, we can do a lot with with you know these private investors where you know we're offering them again, as I mentioned, just like we'd be offering the seller 35 times what they'd be. You know, uh, a friend of ours in, in Arizona he talks about how much more powerful you you at the grocery store when you buy 35 bags of groceries versus the one. Well, same thing here with investors as it is with sellers. We can certainly we can certainly create a note through merging a buyer and a seller or even our own deal as as the investor if we want to hang on to it. Uh, so realistically, we can bring in a private investor's money and think of ourselves as the matchmaker of, of, of merging these three different people who all need something. And, you know, it's, it's really about providing that solution. I think that's a great visual. Yeah. So... When we talk about lease options, and, and that's certainly a popular topic, keep this in mind. When you're providing any type of credit as an investor, and if you're an investor, you're typically selling to an end buyer, which means you're subject to all the new guidelines. When you're providing any type of credit, and of course, uh, if you're rewriting a note as a, as a loan modification or if you're providing a lease option and, and there is consideration in there, and typically lease options have consideration, you are subject to the new laws. Uh, this, we're going we're gonna to go through this really quick. I, uh, I'm, I, Take it this away. Is not a, this is not a fun topic, but it, it's in the next 30 days, they're going to start and begin enforcing it, and they're going to begin enforcing it with a heavy hand because a lot of people are out of compliance. So the SAFE Act was created in 2008, and that created the NMLS. And, of course, the Dodd-Frank Act was created in 2010, and it went in effect January 10th of this year, and it basically just expanded upon the NMLS uh, from the SAFE Act and essentially created this uh, expansion that seller finance transactions have to be done under a mortgage loan originator. Guys, this does not mean that they're illegal or shady or you can't do them. You just need to you just need to have an, a mortgage loan originator someone like us preferably someone that's familiar with how to how to put all these together uh, come into your deal and by the way it, it, I would think it's a good thing to have someone like us uh, help you do your deal uh, the, it makes the it, it, we, we it. always talk mark about building your team and and if you're gonna do this you need a compliant person who understands the regulation on your team yeah. so it, yeah. it is important. Yeah, so um, you know when you do short sales, you have a short sale negotiator. It's kind of the same thing. Um, so here's a quick and easy test. There's still a t one year later, almost a year later. There's still a ton of confusion, a ton of misinformation. Even attorneys don't even understand. And by the way, attorneys are not exempt from the, the new laws uh, for the first time in in real estate history. <laughs> And in, in mortgage history, uh, no one's exempt other than a mortgage loan originator. So if the buyer is a consumer, the transaction is not exempt. This is your quick and easy test. So, so, so if the buyer is not, can... not an investor, so if it's a homeowner, mm -hmm. right, basically. 
Yeah, a consumer, if they're going to occupy the property. Yep. And and amazingly, I, I, it, it, it boggles my mind. Someone always follows up with the question, well, what if, I, what if I'm buying a property? Okay, let's go back to this slide. If the buyer is a consumer, then you're subject to Dodd-Frank. So when you're buying it, it's you, you are not subject to Dodd-Frank. When you are selling and you're providing credit, that's when you're subject to Dodd-Frank. Now keep in mind, when we talk about the value of your paper, the value of your paper is created at the time of origination. So you might be exempt from Dodd-Frank, but you, you're not exempt from writing and Crappy protecting paper. your investment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. right. I mean, it, yeah, like you said, it becomes toilet paper. It's important you have compliant paper if you're going to sell the note. Yeah, and, and the real estate attorney who we work with, and um, he'll be one of our interviews. Uh, we actually interviewed him, and we're, we're going to interview him uh, upcoming again. Uh, he, he's actually appeared before the Supreme Court on, on a lot of this stuff, and he's one of the very few attorneys you can actually meet that understands all this. And, you know, he talks about, you know, he always talks about stinky paper. You, you're writing stinky paper. That's that's your investment. That's what you got. So, uh, again, I don't want to go into this. It, it's It doesn't excite me or thrill me. Um, protecting your assets as what we're doing here, that's exciting. Uh, but realistically, uh, there are some exemptions. If you do take an exemption, you still have to follow the ability to repay guidelines. And the cool thing is, invariably, if you do comply and you are using a mortgage loan originator, you do not have to follow the ability to repay guidelines in as much as they have to be uh, met absolutely and entirely in order to prove the borrower to do the deal. It's now subject to the seller's approval rather than approval with respect to federal guidelines. And this is a big game changer, guys, because this allows you to qualify and expand and widen your buyer pool. Again, we're disclosing everything. The seller wants to, if the seller wants to close and they want to look at compensating factors, make sense compensating factors, which do make sense a lot of times, then it's ultimately up to them to approve it. And you've by virtue of you know, by virtue of using a mortgage loan originator, uh, you have essentially sidestepped the uh, ability to repay guidelines in with respect to the absolute uh, uh, guideline. Good point. So guys, uh, it's Christmas season. Don't be a Grinch. Don't be the Grinch. Um, I mentioned, you know, stop stepping over dollars or trying to step over dollars to pick up pennies. You know, fees, just like we talked about brokering a note, uh, don't get into this. this is all the minutiae. It's highly negotiable. Usually the buyer pays it, and they're paying. They be paying a mortgage loan originator fee unless they're paying cash. They're going to be paying for a fee. So this is a very normal thing. Uh, we can typically build it into the price. It can also be financed, which by the way makes you more money. Uh, it's free insurance, helps you close the deal, and it makes your note much more marketable. Which again, this is your investment. Uh, and it, and it's federal law, so don't be the the three blind mice. Do you do you have like a ballpark on what the fees usually run? Yeah, you know we we charge one we charge one percent uh, mm-hmm. or or a minimum, you know one percent, you know mm-hmm. just just like they would just so like they would pay if they they went to get a loan or a minimum of of two thousand. So, um, okay. you know, if, if, it, if it's a skinny deal and we need, you know, you guys want to work with us on more than just one deal, then, yeah, call us. We, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll work with you. If we bring 30 and, bags yeah. of groceries, you'll help us out, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I can, I can you know, actually expand on that when we get into the Q&A because okay. there are some, some guidelines that um, we can follow. Cool. Yeah, I mean, it's, we're we're on your team. We're here to help you close deals. You know, a mortgage loan originator fee for for someone like us that has experience in this space. Yeah, you can probably go to any mortgage loan originator, and you know, they're, they're probably gonna be confused, and their title and escrow company will be confused the whole you know through yep. the whole process. It'll be very painful for you, but you get someone like us on your team. We're gonna help you close the deal. So, you know, I don't know what the value of that is. I mean, you know, cool. everyone wants to get paid. So, um, you know, don't get caught. Don't get caught with your pants down. Um, you know, from the first moment 
and uh, on our last slide, it has a free disclosure that you guys can download that we give away. It was written cool. by our, our attorney uh, who charges an obscene amount of money, and uh, it's the only thing like it that I'm aware of. At first point of contact, that is when you've essentially fallen into uh, the federal guidelines. And remember, your state might have some guidelines. We even recently found and discovered that uh, the state of Tennessee. Terry, what, Tennessee, yeah, Tennessee law supersedes uh, all the Dodd Frank exemptions. Wow. So there are no exemptions, in, for for instance, in that state. Uh, California has its own laws. Uh, you know, and again, this, this is why you want to uh, be involved with people that know what they're doing in a in a highly, you know, this is Obamacare, but the, for the financial sector, you know, they, they mean business. The CFPB cannot be uh, the head of the CFPB cannot be replaced. So you know they are literally and effectively God. Very good. And and the CFPB stands for the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, and um, the Dodd Frank Act was executed and it's being administrated under it. So this is our this is our process. Um, you know again. Uh, and, and one thing, Jim, if I can ask a favor, uh, if, if when you guys schedule to talk to us, we have a scheduler on our site. Give us a little information as we, we get inquiries all the time. Give us a little background as mm -hmm. to how we can help you instead of just um, instead of just requesting a, an appointment. Uh, th this helps tremendously in terms of manage management of time, and you know everyone wants to. You know, to the degree that we call it to their attention, it, it everyone wants to respect everyone's time. So we just uh, simply ask you to to do that. So this is our our unique process, and um, this is pretty much the end of the presentation. I, I went lightning slide. speed, and yeah, and uh, one thing I wanted to add uh, a real one really cool thing that a lot of people aren't aware of is um, oh, and before I say that. The presentation, we have our old presentation on there, guys, so don't go and, and run and download it yet. It's currently being uploaded. You can download it, I guess, now. Um, the new one's being uploaded and will be on there tonight. On the, And it's and it's basically your own PowerPoint presentation that you can use uh, and add it into your presentation if you're an agent or a loan officer or an investor. And it's designed uh, basically as a presentation to, you know, to convince your seller. Um, a lot of people like freebies that's our Christmas gift to you guys and um, and uh, it's it's also uh, customizable it's not it's not like a PDF you can go in there and copy and paste and cut it up and of course there's the uh, Dodd Frank notes uh, we have an interview series we're halfway through we interviewed Jim it was it was uh, we got really good reviews he was our first interview I had a great and, time because uh, you guys you guys asked me um, unique questions that other People don't usually ask, so I enjoyed that perspective. Yeah, yeah, it was fun. We we really enjoy these. We got four more. The Jim's one is on our YouTube page at Seller Finance Consultants. You can go to our website below and link to it. Uh, and of course, we have the first four on there. We'll be doing two next week, and then two the week after that, uh, as leading up to Christmas, and where we'll we'll be uh, cutting out. We actually are working on a book on this this deal but one thing I wanted to add before I I I'll probably be able to answer a couple questions and now they're probably gonna be calling for me now um, one thing I wanted to add is a lot of sellers and, and this is a really key distinction and, and it, this is something a lot of people don't understand in our industry when you're working with a seller and you're you're presenting this idea and concept of uh, capital gains because the 1031 exchange is under attack so when you're when you're promoting this idea of capital gains deferment, which seller financing absolutely does. How does, of, it, how, does sellers, it, how does it do that, though? Because you still have the sale of the property, Mark, right? And I, I've yeah. seen this come up in your slides a couple of times. So I got to uh -huh. – and there, I know sure. there's other people that are on this call tonight that are going to challenge that a little bit. Sure. Well, basically, uh, it's an installment sale. So you're not – you know, whatever – how is it an installment sale if they are you not giving them the deed at closing? Whatever your it's the consideration. It you know typically on a seller finance deal, you know we're financing 
just you know the the seller's financing 80 90 percent whatever so they're only subject to the you know the, let's say the down payment is uh, fifty thousand okay. dollars so they're they're gonna be paying taxes on that amount what they collected the rest is, is being taken as you know it, it, it's, it's being taken as as a loan as interest so the the cool thing above and beyond that though and, and this is a question probably the, maybe the third or fourth most common question you'll get from from it's not the most common but you definitely get it from people who are savvy they say well I want the income and I want the income to continue what happens you know because I see there's a five year balloon here and and make no mistake you want a balloon on your note and if you don't have a balloon can you uh, do a balloon with yeah. the new Dodd Frank regulation yes with a mortgage loan originator not on your uh, own so if I do my own like I used to then I can't have a balloon but if I use you guys then I can have a balloon. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's you can another huge selling. Benefit. Yeah, it, and and you really need a balloon there to have any type of decent paper. So the seller is going to look at it, and 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 if you have a half intelligent seller, they're going to say, "Well, this has a three year balloon, a five year balloon. I want this income. To, this income needs to last me my life, right?" So one of the things you can do is, and when we go back to this idea of brokering, when they when they get paid off, you can put them into another note. And continue to defer. It's it's even more flexible than a 1031. You could does, also does uh, you could also walk that mortgage over to another property. Mm -hmm. So I mean, if you're creative minded, there's a lot yeah. of ways to continue on. And and I've done that. And moving the substituting the collateral in a note yeah. Yeah. is a great yeah, it's, way to go. So is yeah, I mean, or these wraps. And, yeah. you know, just real quick, Mark, I mean, you can pull all of these concepts you heard tonight. You can pull them all together. I'll give you an example. I did a wholesale deal um, on a small apartment complex uh, under contract, $500,000 with seller financing. So um, I, I could have wholesaled it. I could have bought it, all these different things. But instead, what I did is I basically just resold it um, using a wrap. And I resold it at 575. So I had a $75,000 $75, spread. And um, I put a 5% down payment. I collected a 10%. I purchased it at like 6 or 8%. And I resold it at like 8 or 10%. That's how you create multiple buckets of income on one deal. And we did, yeah. all, we did the whole transaction simultaneously. So I didn't have to bring any money to closing. And and literally, you walk away from closing with a with a nice payday. You get payments every single month. And before that balloon was due, my buyer uh, refied it, and I was cashed out for a third nice payday. And that's why it's important to learn all these different tools and not be that one trick pony. Yeah, yeah, it's important. Um, yeah. So, anyways, I'm I'm I gotta sign Good off. Long. They're calling for me. So okay. I I enjoyed this. Thanks for. Thanks for having me, Jim. And uh, Terry certainly uh, can I'm here answer and any I'm here and questions. ready to go. All right, All right. good. I'm going to start good working night, through the questions. Thank you. Absolutely. Have a good night, guys. All right, guys. I'm glad that's resonating with you and uh, Drew Preet. And, uh, and uh, quite a few of our folks are on the West Coast who can relate to the market that they're in down there. Um, and uh, let me just start looking through the, the slides there. Um, Hang on. One thing me, I uh, wanted to say was that um, tennis, uh, every state has its own. Um, uh, so Dodd-Frank is a federal law. Every state was was given the authority to pass their own laws uh, that supersede or that that extra seed those laws. So so for instance, Tennessee does not have any exemptions, even if you're an investor. Um, um, if you're you're an investor and you're selling to an investor, there's no exemption. Mm -hmm. So every state has its own little quirks potentially. Um, so what we basically talked about here tonight was was the federal law, but there's there's some states that are different. So. Good point. All right, I learned a few things like the um, the uh, the point on the on the balloon because that's something I always put in my notes and I was concerned about that. Yeah, so so you're you, on a balloon. There's an exemption for. Let me explain a little bit um, or expand on that. 
um, on the exemptions, if you're a, a own, if you're if you own a home and let's say you you own the the home next door to you and you've owned it for 20 years and you you're a mom and pop and you just want to sell it and carry the loan instead of um, changing the light bulbs and um, the tenants in there and they're, you're just going to um, sell them the house and carry the loan on it. You can you can um, have a balloon if 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 you if you're under that one exemption for 12 months and you pretty much have a, a clean slate. You can do a balloon. You can do all kinds of things. It's it's there's you don't have to be a lender or know how to do it. But when you get into the second one or the third one, then it has to be fully amortizing. And then also you're not exempt for that that free pass for that one loan if you're actually an investor, an LLC, a corporation, anything like that. There there is no exemption. So so it's a very small window. And then <clears throat> uh, my 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 thought on on this is even if you're Exempted, and you're and you're you're this mom and pop, and you're just doing the one next door. And um, what happens if you want to sell that note, and, and you ha don't have the paperwork, the collateral file that's been created to to back up that you were exempt? Um, then you're, and let's say you know you want to you want to borrow against the note or sell it for you know your daughter's wedding or or for some some emergency. Um, that that loan is going to have no value because you don't have any collateral behind it to to prove that you were exempt, and that's something that people aren't thinking about in this whole law that's going on. Okay, well let me jump into some questions here. Um, here's one from Ricardo, and he said, "So do you actually need an NMLS to do seller financing if you already own the property?" If you already own it. Yeah, so um, if you own a house and you want to sell it with seller financing, do you need an NMLS? I mean, you need that accredited originator, right? Well, only only if you're selling to a consumer and you're meeting the state the state's guidelines, you 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 have that one exemption. But again, you want to if you're ever going to sell that note or borrow against it, you want to. Make mm -hmm. sure that you have a collateral file that that can prove that you are exempt. So, you, you so Ricardo, to answer your question too, just to kind of summarize that, you can do one deal um, any way that you want, more or less. Um, Correct. But if you're going to do more than one deal and it's not with an investor, in other words, it's an end user who's going to live in the house and be a homeowner, then then you will need that, yes. Is that pretty close, Terry? Yep, yep. All and right. you know what? We'll answer these questions if someone mm -hmm. wants to contact us and just be sure, because because yeah. there's a lot of there's a lot of variations in it. it they've made it confusing on purpose. <laughs> Good point. Um, Lisa said, "I tried to offer uh, make an offer on a bulk deal in Florida. They wanted to sell the property is valued at two thirty seven, so I offered two hundred cash or three hundred k." Owner finance with 20% down, 8% interest, close in 10 days, and they turned me down. They want 600000 but the value is 273 What do I do? I think, Lisa, you let that one go and uh, be glad you didn't get it. Um, you are closing a lot of deals, and, uh, you know, if it doesn't meet your investment criteria, my advice is let it go, but stay in touch with them because they may come back and be more flexible in the future. Yeah, I have a I have a, a story on something that's similar that we just did this year Good. in San Diego. San Diego, we had a um, a property for sale, um, a duplex that was uh, let's it was four hundred thirty thousand, but okay. it was trashed and you couldn't get a bank loan on it, and it was worth four four thirty all day long. So um, so. The real estate agent had one of a fix and flipper come in, and and give you know their bottom bottom offer or whatever that they felt that they could re rehab the house with, and the offer came in at 350 and the sellers accepted it, all cash, but then they they wanted another 20 grand on you know concession after they walked through it, and the seller said no you know 350 is where we're at not 330, so in the meantime. A buyer came in um, and offered full price with 30% down, and seller financing at 8% for 
for five years, and they were a consumer, um, and the um, seller turned down that offer, and it was an eighty thousand dollar upside. Wow. So, and and the reason why they turned it down was because it was an estate sale, and you had three siblings that didn't trust each other. And they all wanted their money so they could go spend it and buy cars or whatever they wanted to do. So, so this was a very important lesson that you have to find out the motivation of the seller. It's not always about top dollar um, and, and ask questions and find out what, what's behind their motivation. So what, what I actually did was I bought that house with full disclosures to both buyer and seller. Um, I bought it for three fifty and I resold it three days later to that. Um, that investor um, <laughs> for 430 on 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 the note with 30 percent down. So I have a wow. 305 thousand dollar note um, that I only have 220 and two. Um, What's your rate of return on that one? I, I it say was, it's good um, enough, right? It's 17 percent over the five years. If I that's sell it, awesome. And and to somebody that has an IRA, you know, that that's happy with an eight percent return, then it'll be much higher because I can do my internal rate of return figures and it'll be, you know, 30, 40%. So and that's how wealth is created. Absolutely. Very good deal. All right. Ricardo came back with another question on the, uh, the, the originator. He said, does this apply only to residential or commercial as well? Only residential. Uh, keep in mind it's one to four units and it's consumers. The, the key to it is that if your buyer is a consumer, and, and the reason why we say consumer is because that's that's how Dodd Frank defines um, the category. Um, so a consumer is, you know, just think of the, of the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau (CFPB). Um, consumer is is what this all this whole law was created around, and um, so. Anytime that the owner is going to occupy it, or their children, or the, or some member of the family, then then that will be considered um, owner occupied, or, or or it will be apply under Dodd Frank. So when you have commercial, when you have five or more units, um, when you have land, anything that's that's not owner occupied is going to be an investment, and and everybody's exempt. Okay, very good. And uh, Roy, uh, Roy, how are you? It's good to see your question tonight. He said, Jim, do I need to add a, a mortgage loan originator onto my power team to be Dodd-Frank compliant? You want to take that one, Terry? Yeah, the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Yeah, if, yeah. You, if you're building a team, this is an important component. And there are markets and there are opportunities where it does make really good sense to resell with seller financing rather than holding it as a rental. There's there's times where you'll want to do one and not the other and, and so on. So, yes. <clears throat> yeah, I've been driving around, you know, I call it flyover country. Um, if you're not on the East Coast or the West Coast, you know, you have normal prices. And um, some statistics, it, it, it costs about $6,000 to originate a Fannie Mae loan, like an FHA or, or a conventional loan through... Uh, normal institutional means, and and the banks aren't willing to to really finance loans under a hundred thousand when it's going to cost them six six percent in fee you know in in their own you know origination um, you know their underwriting fees and their delivery fees to the to the um, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac it, it's you know they're they're going to banks are going to want to lend on half half a million dollar loans and you know not not hundred thousand dollar loans or less so the whole flyover country middle America is I think it's wide open to seller financing um, you know buy the house you know flip it uh, carry the loan you know and mm -hmm. whatever exit strategy you have and, and sell the loan off to, to somebody that needs the income stream for their retirement and there's it's just it's a simple <laughs> Either yeah, or keep it exactly. A lot yeah, of different exactly. directions you can go. Um, sure. <clears throat> I got a uh, a question that came in also about the foreign buyers. Um, yeah. And they're wondering how would you go about connecting to or finding some of these foreign buyers that have the larger down payments. 
Do you have any well, ideas we, on that? Do you go out and talk to the the loan officers and your do you network with them and say, can you give me some leads where you can't qualify people or or something like that, or how would you go about doing that? What what's been working for us is um, you could go to um, well, first of all, we're on the Mexican border down in San Diego, so <laughs> Good point. so we have a lot of Hispanic people that that are that we've met through like LinkedIn or 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 some some um, actually Mark lives in Mexico. He lives in TJ and he drives across every day. Wow. So um, so we've been able to meet people from Mexico that ha that are managing money from Mexico. So that's that's one source that we've we've been been um, able to tap um, our attorney Jim Eckley. He has he 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 um, has clients that bring in foreign money. Um, so an attorney would be a good resource. Someone that does maybe um, you know some kind of of foreign you know that, that that represents people that are foreigners that want to bring their money in. That would be another reason. LinkedIn is a way to do it. Um, also a loan officer, my wife does home loans, mm -hmm. just regular normal home yeah. loans and and they all have foreign investor programs but, but they're limited to 50% um, down in, and I don't know if the guidelines have changed or not, they change all the time but it's, it's, it's been 50% down for a long time. But with seller financing you can do 5% down, there's no, there's no uh, you know, there's no guidelines or, or Dodd Frank Act that that limits the amount of down payment that you can take down um, mm -hmm. from a foreigner or anybody else. You just have to. Um, so if you network loan with with loan officers and and ask them for some leads that they can't quite convert, I mean, they, exactly, it's an opportunity. Yeah, yeah exactly. <clears throat> okay, let's see. Where did we leave? Randy Goldman said, "Thank you, Mark and uh, Terry, very much." Uh, Peter Banyan said, New Jersey, question mark. Uh, Peter, I'm not sure what, what your question about New Jersey is, but I would say uh, uh, buying and selling with seller financing in New Jersey would be a very good strategy. Any of the high-end markets, um, like Terry and I were talking about Long Island, uh, that's why we were talking about Nick, and, and we have Mike Holt in Manhattan and other people, um, where it can be difficult to – be a landlord and cash flow real easily because you have very high property taxes, and uh, but you could you could um, buy and sell on seller financing and create those income streams and get a lot of the same benefits that way. Yeah, so, create be the bank, carry the loan, the and be the bank, and and then you're not subject to the taxes going up all the time. That homeowner is. All right, Mark Rosen said. Uh, Hello, if I'm limited with Dodd-Frank and also in the Texas market, how do I handle doing multiple deals per month with seller financing, being an, uh, being an ex, I can't pronounce, executor contract? I think he's saying in Texas, they have some different regulation. And I know that's true of a lease option, Mark, um, but uh, I don't believe that doing seller financing in Texas is an issue. Uh, maybe you can help me understand your local uh, regulation on that a little bit. And keep in mind, everybody, that uh, Mark, Terry, myself, Daniel, none of us are able to provide you with legal and tax advice. Um, so we always say consult your attorneys and ta tax professionals as well. Um, but Mark, can you give me a little bit more information on what your concern is? Um, I agree with you. I know in Texas um, there's regulation against lease options and contract for deed, uh, but straight up seller financing, you should be good to go. I think you're right as, as well. I think that's the right advice. All right. Here's Nick in Long Island just sent in a question, Terry. Um, he says, I've got a good paying tenant who is interested in buying the house. They don't have much of a down payment and they can't qualify for tr traditional financing. I owe 128 on the mortgage with a fixed rate of just under 5%, 21 years left on the loan. <clears throat> the home uh, may be slightly underwater. How could I structure a deal to sell them this house? <laughs> well, the and the fact that it's underwater does, or maybe slightly underwater, doesn't 
meat make a lot of um, it, you know it shouldn't be a big a big issue um, because you know you can wrap the loan um, and create a new 30-year loan you can all right let's talk about that it. real quick because I've done that okay. I've done that, Terry, also, and I've and I've done it before I quit using banks. Now it sounds like Nick has a conventional financing um, as his primary mortgage. So right. if you if you wrap it and you sell it, what happens if you have to foreclose to your underlying? If note? you wrap, well. Um, you, what you do is, well, first of all, um, it would help to read the note and, and make sure that... Let's say it's a typical Fannie, you, so Fannie Mae compliant type loan. With an acceleration clause. Right? Because, yeah, I mean, because they could, they could, they could uh, you know, jack up the due on sale clause. There's different things that could happen there that create a little bit of risk. So right. you got to be a little bit careful with that wrap. I've done it, and I foreclosed on somebody, um, okay. and it wasn't an issue because before we went to auction, they paid me off. Okay. But and when well, that happened to me personally, I got nervous and I thought, man, you know, I, maybe I shouldn't have done that transaction. I would have to say that that it it, it is a strategy, but I think it's it's. It's a strategy that that someone should maybe have the have to have the ability to to pay off the underlying loan, or at least keep it current if if um, the the buyer decides not to pay on the wrap. What about this, uh, Terry? What if he did it on like a contract for deed, and then it, then well, it truly is an installment sale? Well. Um, not if not if the the buyer um, records that contract and puts a cloud on the title. Um, okay. Jim Eckley actually has a really he's done thousands of these and his 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 proven strategy is is to do a series of renewable leases. Mm -hmm. um, if you read the note, it'll they they'll it, It'll say that you, if you um, write, if you have a lease on the property that's over three years, then it, then the bank can call the note. So, so what he does is he writes the lease so that it doesn't violate the due on sale clause in the note, and he just makes it renewable, um, and then he mimics the payments to the principal, interest, taxes, and insurance payment on the note. And um, and that's how he that's how he structures. So he does a um, sort of like a, a um a re, you know a, a full blown lease option. He does a lease and then he makes the option. You Separate. know, basically um, the the buyer can execute the option is when the renewable leases are all up, and that will make the and that and that's when the loan is paid off. Do you know? Um, and I know we can't provide tax advice, but do you know if that constitutes a sell? Um, on your tax the return. way the way Jim writes them up, um, his his the people that that are doing these, the buyer is able to um, take the tax write off as well. Okay, so the answer is yes. So there are some yeah. different ways you can do that. That sounds like pretty good advice to look into. Hope yeah. that helped you out there, Nick. I know what your intention is um, as far as reducing your your taxable uh, income and stuff like that. So. Um, sounds like we've got some things to think about and look into. Roy said, um, how are origination fees calculated and made up based upon created or scheduled? <laughs> okay, that would be for seller financing. Mm -hmm. That's probably the context. Okay, so Dodd-Frank says that um, that uh, the, loaner, the loan uh, for a consumer loan, the interest rate cannot exceed Six and a half percent of um, in excess of prime for usury. So, um, it's it's it, it it falls into a high cost category. Okay. It's called a high cost loan. So so right now that's nine and three quarters. So that's our limit on the interest rate. And once you go past that, it is possible to go higher than that. But then you have to have the buyer take a a class. Um, 
that's like an online class for for um, usury loans. I don't, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it almost sounds you know, so that they know, so that they know what they're getting into. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And, and then and then along with that interest rate is it, the fees cannot exceed three percent of the loan amount. So um, and if you're un, between six, I, let's see, I have to remember this. If you're between forty thousand and a hundred thousand, the fees cannot go over three thousand dollars. And if you're below forty thousand, um, you're limited to five percent of the loan amount. So. So um, I never thought I'd have to deal with you know anything below a hundred thousand being from San Diego, but now that I've looked at properties, you know, in 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 Pennsylvania and Ohio, um, we could run into that a lot. So the fee structure is going to be based on. Well, if you, you know, go over the border and start doing some deals in Tijuana, you'll be there too. There, there you go. <laughs> and uh, another question from Franz was, um, what is the fee back to seller finance consultants? I think you guys said it's typically 1% origination. Yeah, with a, it's. And what I've you had, do is you I've pass had, that on to your buyer. That's the, the best answer is the buyer should pay the fee because. I agree. Because they're the ones. That's what that banks do. Well, of course. And, and so put on you know for the for us investors to put our cap on and and think that oh you know you know it's just another person with their hand out yes the law created it and there's a, been a paradigm change in in this law and it's totally the way things used to be are are never going to be again so take you know just forget about the past and move forward and and just accept it and and have the buyer pay the fee and create a really good collateral file for a really good note and so that it's saleable or if you ever wanted to sell it or borrow against it. And um, what what we're doing or trying to do at Seller Financing Consultants is to create a standard that that hopefully everybody can can accept and live by. And, and if it and if there is this standard out there. Then, then we can do these buying and selling of notes. It's basically creating a securitized market that that we can believe in, and um, people are all above board, you know. Hopefully, and and um, you know, have a, a a good way of of doing these deals and and getting rid of the banks. So. I'm all about getting rid of the banks. All right, yeah. and uh, Mark Rose in in uh, Texas uh, did chat back he said um, the contracts um, the, the issue is with contracts where the deed does not transfer within 180 days so typically on a seller finance um, you can you can transfer the deed right away you can do it right at closing and yeah uh, you're that, the bank that's not an issue you are the bank that is absolutely correct. right so you should yeah. be good to go and connor said um, yeah he said the same thing owner financing in texas is good to go just be careful of sandwich leases and lease options. All right, David Phelps, you are on. David, I would like to unmute you and talk to you if you're available, if you got a headset. He said there are limits in Texas on the number of seller finance transactions that one can do in a fiscal year. David, do you know what the quantity is? And is that per entity, per land trust? I mean, is there ways around that? I'm just curious. Um, <clears throat> oh, is that, is that a Texas... Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But he already okay. answered the question. He said the answer is never to be the seller. and Instead, use land trusts and other entities. So okay. there, he's already got his work around, of course, because David is super sharp. Uh, Terry, you need to get to know David. Okay. Right. Uh, Mark uh, also said deeds uh, deed needs to transfer within 180 days. So lease option seller finance where the contract is not finalized within 180 days. Yep, sounds good. Um, I learned something today. Yeah, how about that? Me yeah. too. I've learned several things. Um, Nick said he would like to get your contact information, Terry. All right. So do you want to uh, tell everybody what your best email is? Yeah. So um, it could be Terry, T-E-R-R-Y, at sellerfinanceconsultants.com. I'm writing it for you guys on my whiteboard. Yeah. Yeah. 
two L's, not three. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a new version. And and then my cell phone is eight five eight. Mm -hmm. 699-3139. Okay. I'd, ha I'd be happy to you know answer a few questions for people. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to, uh, to expand on the installment sale a little bit. Okay. Um, because that, because that, um, that scenario I told you where um, I actually bought the note or I, I flipped that property, you know, with an eighty thousand dollar gain. Um, the the um, escrow wanted to charge me. Um, I think it's three and a half percent of the purchase price for that sale as as a tax that that I have to you know turn around and try to get back from the IRS when I file my my annual tax return. And I wasn't going for that. So so. They're not going to sit there and tell you what your alternatives are. You have to find out for yourself. But I thought I'd throw in that um, there is a, the, on the forms that you get the 1090 or the, what is it the 593 or whatever the form is that escrow gives you when you're when you're selling a house. You can opt to and the way they word it is real convoluted. But you can opt to have the buyer pay. The the principal and a percentage of the installment that you're getting per month. So if you're getting um, a let's say in this case I was getting um, seventy five dollars in principal per month and that's being carved out of the two thousand dollar payment. Um, um, the servicer that's servicing this loan is going to carve out a check to the IRS for that 3.8% or whatever the percentage is of the principal that I'm getting per month. And that's how I avoid paying the tax on the gain um, of that sale. And then, and then on, the, um, uh, on another subject, on an installment sale with a seller, um, let's say the sellers own the house forever and it's fully depreciated and all you have left is land value. So the seller carries the loan with Let's say no money down. Um, every time that seller gets a payment, the principal portion of that is is taxable as a capital gain, and then the interest portion is taxable as uh, um, passive income. So, so you're not taxed on the sale of the house. You know at the at in that year, that's going to drive up your your tax return, you know, from let's say a hundred thousand to two hundred thousand in that one year because you haven't received your principal. You you've you've elected to carry it as an installment, so you get to treat it as an installment sale, and and the principal you get you pay on an annual basis on the principal you receive. Now, if you put a balloon on that note and it pays off on that fifth year, you're going to be in, in that high tax scenario again. So that's why a lot of sellers may not want to ever get their loan paid off. Um, so when you're when you're consulting with a seller and they're considering seller financing, you really need to know and have them talk to their CPA about their financial situation and what their goals are. If it's if it's an older couple, and they have to have that income, um, they don't want to get paid off, and so you you need to have that consider that as part of what you're putting to get together. Good points. That, does that make sense? Yep. And um, okay. we're we're nearing the end of the questions, which is good. Um, when you guys are in the Facebook area, you might want to check out this um, probate marketing strategy video I put on here. It's a very unique one. It's down a little ways. If I, maybe if I click like, it'll go back to the top. And then uh, one other thing, I noticed that uh, Bo from San Francisco is on. And um, Bo, this kind of stuff will work good in San Francisco. You're in a very high-end market, and it's a, it's a way of creating the cash flow um, that you're looking for. 
Um, but I also wanted to give a shout out to Bo because as you guys, uh, those of you that are in our community that know Bo knows that um, he's an HGTV reality star, oh, and, cool. <laughs> uh, which is awesome. And But what's really cool is uh, he's created a, a new show. And if I remember right, he's got it licked. So there it is. He was on Flip It to Win It, and um, but now he he's also working on on getting his own show produced, and uh, it looks like he's got that worked out. So I just want to give a big congratulations to Bo. He's a he's an important member of our community and and a great resource for us. Um, so Bo, congratulations to you. Um, what other um, questions do you guys have? David Phelps just wrote a note in here. Be sure to differentiate investor installment sales tax treatment versus being a dealer. That is a good point. It's a good differentiator. If you buy and sell on a regular basis as an investor, then the installment sales don't apply and the tax can be a deal killer. And, right. uh, you know, one way around that, David, thinking out loud here, and um, that's the beauty of a mastermind, is, uh, you know, you may want to have different entities for different kinds of deals. Um, and uh, Also do these deals way. in your IRA, preferably a Roth, and then you don't have to worry about any of it. Yeah, great idea. So good stuff. Yeah, thanks, Bo. I appreciate that. I, I Bo, seriously, I'm super excited for you. And uh, I'm glad you, uh, yeah, you are definitely tuned in. I appreciate the little note back. And David, I really appreciate your input tonight. I love having note people on these calls because it, um, it stretches everybody's thinking a little bit. And I have a request if you, yeah, that I'd like ahead. to throw in. Um, you need to be licensed in every state to do these yep. deals or the state that you're doing them in. And I'm licensed in California and Washington State. It, it, the, it's a prohibitive cost to get licensed in every state plus so, time. And so how do you do you do so, every state? Do you, do, you, do you outsource it or what do you do? Well, yeah, that's and that's the request is is I can actually um, for just a a flat fee we can do the the underwriting and provide the the compliant okay. process that component. It, yeah, but what I need is I need a, a mortgage loan originator. Right now, I need one in North Carolina. I need one in Indiana, and I need one in New York and Pennsylvania, and if if I can have people that understand what we're doing that have the mortgage orig origination license, then we can work together and provide, you know, uh, cover the states so that we can be, you know, mm -hmm. they're not all going to say be seller finance consultants companies, but right. the individuals will know what to do, and um, that's how we can help people in, in like on the East Coast um, through a mortgage loan originator in that state even if they don't know what you know know what they're doing to begin with do you have one in Virginia nope okay so I could use some referrals yeah I might um, actually be able to give you one one of our members um, in okay. Virginia might be willing to do it he certainly understands it so that's half the battle yeah okay um, cool Any other questions tonight? Uh, Bo said, by the way, he says he has a good idea and a connection, so let Terry know that I can help him. So I guess okay. you guys will connect. You're both on the West Coast. One's up north, one down south, but it's all That'd good. That'd be great. And we, have, we actually have members, Terry, in the city you're staying in tonight, Cleveland, Ohio. Is that right? Yeah. In Cleveland? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We have we have several it's new cold here. folks in Ohio. Yes, it is. <laughs> you don't have to tell me I'm from Buffalo. <laughs> I put yeah. some trash in the trash can, and there's icicles, you know, frozen on it. And I'm going, Jesus. <laughs> All right, guys, Terry, you've been been a tremendous guest, and uh, and I really you. appreciate your your insight. And I love having good note folks on on these calls because it expands our thinking. And uh, when you can yeah. do that and you can be more than a one-trick pony, you can do deals different ways is a good thing.
So you can do uh, so much with notes. It's unbelievable. Yeah, I agree with you. So uh, you guys okay. have an awesome night and and uh, go go make some offers and make some deals and create some cash flow for yourselves and and uh, make it happen, guys. And we'll talk again soon. Thanks so much, Terry, for being here. Okay, take care. Really appreciate it. Bye. Bye-bye.